Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you so very much for your love for us. We thank you for the opportunity and the place and the time to gather together and to worship, to have the opportunity, the privilege, the freedom to sing, to pray, to have your word both read out loud and proclaimed, to offer our lives in response, to give you thanks. And we pray now that you will indeed open our hearts and our minds to receive all that you would give us. Teach us, O oh Lord. So may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. And we pray in Christ's name, amen. Can we please be seated? My name is Bruce Greeno, and I'm one of the uh, pastors privileged to serve in this church with you. And Pastor Mark and uh, his wife Linda are uh, spending a little bit of time with uh, some of their family, uh, a little bit up north. And we'll be... So we are in a series on the Gospel of Luke, or the Gospel according to Luke, this supposed uh, possible physician who himself began to follow Jesus and spending time with many of Jesus' disciples, with uh, the Apostle Paul as well, and began to record the different experiences and words that people remembered as they spent time with Jesus. And one of the things that we recognize in this gospel account, as well as all the gospel accounts, is an opportunity to encounter God. That, that is the primary reason of Scripture. We need to hold that very tightly and carefully. Scripture is not given to us so that we can figure out how to get it right, how to do all the right things so that we can know God or, or we can be loved by God or we can love God. The primary reason that we have Scripture is because God has given it to us Himself that we might know Him. This is God's Word revealing who He is, His heart, His character, His purpose. And if there's one thing that's clear throughout all of Scripture, it is that this God loves His creation, loves you and me, and there isn't a thing that we can do that does not keep God from pursuing us. There is nowhere we can go, nowhere we can hide, that God does not seek us out to reconcile us to Himself, to redeem our lives, to make of us who He always intended us to be, a people after His own heart. And so we are spending some time looking at the, the gospel according to Luke, specifically that we might see who this pursuing God is. And before any kind of understanding of the pursuit we might make of this God, it is so very important for us to understand this God pursued us long before we ever thought about seeking Him. And so we've been moving through this, and, and, and we've had a couple of times to encounter uh, some experiences that John, who was baptizing people, calling them to uh, repent and to bear the fruit of repentance, to be ready for the one who is to come. But we have to read of really what becomes one of the last encounters of John the Baptist in the gospel according to Luke. So will you hear these words? They come to us from the chap chapter 7, verses 18 through 30. These are the very words of God. The disciples of John reported all these things to him, and John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? 
in that hour, he, Jesus, healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, and I tell you, more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all the people heard this, and tax collectors too, they declared, God is just, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. These are the very words of God. Thanks be to God. John is just one of the most interesting characters in all of Scripture. We know that he was pretty fiery. Other gospel accounts tell us that he came uh, preaching this message of repentance and bearing the fruit of repentance. And when he did that, he he was wearing uh, strange clothes camel clothing. He he had a strange diet. He ate bugs and honey. And that might have been strange to us, but certainly in his own time and place, that would not have been strange at all. It would have been very well understood. He is pointing to the scriptures. John brought people out into the wilderness, and he called them to repentance to baptize themselves, to wash off the impurities of sin. This is a picture of the Jordan River just north of the Sea of Galilee. Many scholars today actually believe that Jesus or John was baptizing in this area. You know, he, he cried out also about injustice. And, and he notably cried out against Herod, the son of Herod the Great, who was the governor of the region of Galilee about the injustice of, of Herod's life, the, 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 the sin in Herod's life of stealing his brother's wife and, and marrying her himself. And that didn't sit very well with Herod, so Herod threw him in prison. And that is where we are now in chapter 7 of the Gospel of Luke. You see, while in prison, John gets the doubts. Now, I find that absolutely remarkable incredible, actually. I mean, by his own admission uh, that we read in the gospel according to John, John says that he witnessed something I would think would seal all doubt. Take it all away forever. I mean, it's like what we always wanted, right? We want the voice of God to come down and say, it's all true. Therefore, believe. God will only do that at the Super Bowl or during the Olympics, right? I mean, that would be a remarkable opening ceremony. (laughs) The Gospel of John tells us that John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him, on Jesus. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. And yet, when prison comes, John begins to wonder. 
And it seems that John was expecting Jesus' mission to maybe be different than what he was experiencing, especially in prison. I mean, John's own understanding of his call, his task in preparing the way for the Messiah might be best summed up with these very words. John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. That ought to get your attention, right? It, it, it's important for us to understand John got the message right. He fulfilled his call, a call that was placed upon his life before he was ever conceived. He announced that Messiah was coming. He called people to repentance. He called people to bear the fruit of that repentance. But maybe he misunderstood Jesus' agenda, his mission. Apparently, he expected Jesus to do something very different than what he was experiencing, than what he was hearing and seeing about Jesus, especially sitting there in prison. And there, are, there, were, there were a variety of expectations in this day for who Messiah would be and what Messiah would do when Messiah came. That the Messiah would be this, this mighty warrior king who would come in in great triumph and, 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 and completely cleanse the land of all foreigners, purify it, and set up his eternal kingdom. Or he would, he would come into the temple and he would cleanse out all of the priests who weren't serving God correctly. He would be a prophet exactly like Moses. John's question comes from his own understanding and expectations that he would know of Scripture. Like everybody else who had all of these different expectations, you could make a case in Scripture for all of those expectations. John's probably came from the prophet Malachi. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sift as a refiner and purifier of silver and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. Are you this one to come? This one who should be coming like a refiner's fire with his winnowing fork in his hand? Or Isaiah 66, for behold, the Lord will come in fire in his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger in fury. And his rebuke with flames of fire, for by fire will the Lord enter into judgment. And by his sword with all flesh, and those slain by the Lord shall be many. Are you this one who is coming? Are you the one to come? Or shall we expect another? Well, Jesus also answers from Scripture. And Luke is careful to point out that Jesus' actions, at the very moment that John's disciples are coming, here he is. He is healing. People, people with great infirmary are being healed. Blind are given sight. Lame people are raised up so they can walk. And then he answers... John's own disciples. And he says, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. 
The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. See, Jesus' answer also comes from prophecy, from a number of passages within Isaiah. What's interesting is that Jesus is, is also responding very much within the expectations of Messiah, All the people had. One of those expectations is the Messiah would never just stand in front of you and say, I am the Messiah. There there was a sort of hidden Messiah concept that when Messiah came, it would be the, the way he fulfilled Scripture that would point to who he was. And one of those expectations is that there were certain healings that only Messiah could do. You need to know that there were other people, other rabbis in uh, in that day who were very capable of doing miraculous healings. It wasn't actually against the norm. We don't get that. We don't see that very often here. I think mostly because we just don't actually believe Jesus will anymore. You can go to a lot of other places in the world and see miraculous healings where the Holy Spirit is given freedom. But there were four types of healings it was believed only Messiah could do. Dr. Uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum is the one who writes about these. He's a Jewish Christian scholar, and he's the one who says that a person born blind, only Messiah would be able to give them their sight back. Someone who had leprosy because no person with leprosy, no Jew with leprosy had been healed since the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. Miriam's healing came before that. And the only other person in scripture who's ever healed of leprosy is Naaman the Syrian, a Gentile. When Messiah came, he would be able to heal Jewish people who had skin disease. Those who were deaf and mute, unable to speak. Messiah would be able to give them that ability again. And those who had been dead four days in the tomb. You see, it was believed that the spirit of a person hovered over the body for about three days. And so you would always have somebody sit outside a tomb for three days just to make sure. Help me. Help me out. I mean, think about it. We, they did not have what we have today who can really determine the actual death of a person. It was not terribly uncommon that we thought you were dead, so we put you in the tomb, and you woke up. But four days. It is one of the reasons why scholars believe Jesus waited until the fourth day to raise Lazarus. He's pointing to who he is as Messiah. And so Jesus very carefully points John's disciples to scripture passage that John would have clearly understood. He's not telling them directly, but directly he's telling them through scripture. Go back and tell John what you see and what you hear. But it is notable that in these very same prophecies from Isaiah, Jesus leaves something out. From the very same prophecy that he read in the synagogue at Nazareth at the very beginning of his ministry where he included these words, he does not include them now. And they are these words. And those who are captive will be set free. Those who are imprisoned will be released. Instead, what Jesus says is go back and tell John what you see and what you hear. Lame walk, blind see, dead are raised, deaf here, and blessed who are not offended by me. And I think that in many ways, Jesus is telling John, John, you have fulfilled your mission. You've done everything that your life was given to you to do, and Messiah is here, but you are not getting out of prison. Would that be a hard word to hear? We know that the truth of the matter is that Herod puts John to death. He never does get out of prison. So then Jesus turns to the crowd and he says, what did you go out to see? 
out there in the wilderness? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in king's courts. What then did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, and I tell you, more than a prophet. You got to see a reed shaken by the wind. There was a a parable well known at that time that I think would have instantly come to mind to those his listeners. It's called the the parable of the reed and the oak tree. And basically the parable goes like this. The, The reed blows wherever the wind blows. And it bends to the wind. No matter the strength of the storm, it just falls to whatever side the wind blows. But the oak tree, when the storm comes, the oak tree stands firm and it's strong. If the storm is so great that the oak tree falls over, it does not snap back like a reed. It will die. The oak tree will stand against the storm to the point of its death. What do you have to see? Someone who just blows wherever the wind blows? Who, who goes this way and that way and follows the whim of the crowd? Or someone who came and stood no matter the storm and stood for the purposes of God and fulfilled his call and stands there to the point of his death? Or what did you go out to see? Someone who's dressed in soft clothing? Those are the ones who live in king's courts. No, you went out and you saw this guy who's dressed in camel clothing. He's eating bugs and honey. In other words, you went out to see one who looks exactly like Elijah. And Elijah was that prophet who came with incredible power and fire in his belly. He could outrun kings on chariots. And he never bent to the will of King Ahab or Jezebel. Invited to live in Ahab's court, commanded to follow Ahab's will, Jezebel's will, Elijah never did, and neither did John. John fulfilled his mission, but maybe he just got a little bit of the mission of Jesus wrong. That Jesus isn't coming, at least this time, in judgment, he's coming with mercy. And with compassion. Jesus, John lived into his call. He got the message he was sent to proclaim absolutely correct. He prepared the way. He called people to repentance, to bearing the fruit of repentance. But he seems to have misunderstood that the mission of Jesus in his coming at this point is not judgment, but mercy. Mercy. And grace and compassion. And blessed are all who are not offended by me. Those born of women, none greater than John, but the least in the kingdom, the kingdom that Jesus has brought, the least, those who would follow and serve in the kingdom by the power of the Holy Spirit that came after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension. Think of the power they will have to carry on the mission and the agenda of Jesus. Are you the one who is to come or shall we expect another? Is Jesus the one who we want to follow? And is the Jesus we want to follow the one who actually came? See, that's one of the questions I get out of this. John was absolutely faithful to the call, but he missed a bit of the mission of Jesus. What about us? John asked the question, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Is the Jesus who came the one we actually want to follow? Or are we looking for another? 
maybe our lives tell the answer. I mean, who do we expect Jesus to actually be? What do we actually expect Jesus to do in the reality that he has come, that he is the Lord and Savior of the world? Do we want Jesus to be that Lord and Savior of our lives? Maybe it gets revealed in how we actually live our lives. What it is that we would hope that God would bless in our lives, is that something that God has any intention of blessing? I long for for God to bless my, my whole life, and yet have I actually surrendered it into his care? I want God to bless my marriage, but I have no intention of actually living in such a way as to bless my spouse. I want God to bless my business, and yet I've never given anything to God to which I would actually entrust him for. I want God to bless my finances, but I've never given God a red cent for the work of the kingdom. Is the Jesus who came the one we want to follow? Is the Lord and Savior we find in Scripture who calls disciples to follow him and they get up, leave everything, and actually do? The one we've actually entrusted ourselves to be Lord and Savior over in and through our lives. It's not an easy question. But the Jesus who came, came to bring us mercy and grace and compassion in the pursuit of our lives that we would indeed entrust fully to him, our whole lives. And that we might walk in the very same manner that he walked. And that we too might be people of mercy and compassion and justice, grace. But it does not come without entrusting our lives to the Jesus who actually came. Blessed are all who are not offended by me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love for us. We admit that we have a very real idea of who you are and all that it means to follow you. And we confess that there is a lot that we wish you would bless in our lives and yet have never given you anything to actually bless. We pray that you you would continue to to teach us and we would hear and we would see the one who actually came and and what it is that you are about in this world and what it means to get up, leave everything and follow you. You, the one who came, not just the one we want. Show us your way, O Lord, your heart. Give us ears to hear the world as you hear it, to the cries of those who cry out for mercy and grace and compassion and justice. Give us eyes to see the world as you see it, the very people who need your compassion. That we may follow not be offended by you, that we may be entrusted to you and your care, and that in the manner of our lives, walking in the same manner in which Jesus walked, the world would know. In this, we would trust and hope we are praying in the name of Jesus. Amen.